<clears throat> All right. So let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about blog three. And again, both blog three and four are due by this Saturday, 1159. If you already sort of completed blogs three and four, then you don't necessarily have to worry about this particular section. Um, you can sort of, it, it, you know, if you're trying to listen to this on um, Blackboard later, you can sort of skip ahead if you already did this. If you haven't done three or four yet and still sort of uneasy about how to go about, about approaching, then obviously uh, read the stuff in the book first and then watch the video. Um, if you look here, I'm basically asking three questions for each one of these blogs. Uh, for the first one is basically what is the purpose for you to write on your topic for essay one? So what I'm looking at basically is what is the reason you are writing essay one on your topic? So you want to go a little bit more beyond just, well, Mr. Wilson told me that I needed to write it for a good grade or I want to A. There has to be a particular reason why you chose either topic one, two, or three, and why you want to write two to four pages on it. Uh, because everybody has that goal in mind that it's a requirement. I need to turn it in before this date. I want to get the A or the good grade on it. Uh, but not everybody has a similar reason as it relates to your own personal topic, the one that you chose. So that's the only thing I'm looking for there. One sentence will be suffice. You don't have to give me paragraphs. You don't have to give me a novel. Just give me one sentence that answers that question. And for pretty much all of these questions, I just need one sentence. You want to be complete. You want to be straightforward. You want to be concise. I should be able to get you know the answer from your one sentence. Uh, number two, what is who is the audience for your essay one? So think about the individual or groups whom you are addressing in essay one. Now, obviously, I'm going to be one part of the audience member because I'm the teacher. I'm going to be grading the essay at the end. But who else would have some sort of an interest in that paper? If you had it published, let's say, somewhere in England or somewhere in Japan or somewhere, you know, in Texas, Anybody that's old enough to understand what you're trying to say basically understands the English language. Who else would you be addressing in the essay? Is it a multiple audience, meaning men, women, and children would get it? Uh, is, is there a certain age limit that you're looking for, basically 13 and older or 25 and older? What's the demographics? Uh, what sort of the education level? Do they have a GED? Do they have a high school diploma? Do they have... Um, two-year college, four-year college, master's, PhD. So you're thinking of all of that when you're writing not only essay one, but particularly anything that you write always has a purpose and you always have to sort of keep in mind who your audience is going to be. Uh, because in the end, you don't want to offend anybody. Uh, you don't want to leave anybody out. So you want to keep the audience and the purpose always sort of in the forefront of writing this essay, writing the next essay, writing the research paper, writing any paper outside of this class. So just keep that in mind. The third question for blog three is what is your tone in essay one? So in another way is what you're looking at is what is your attitude that you convey about your essays subject or you can look at subject as being topic. Is your tone neutral? Is it objective? Is it subjective? Is it comical? Is it aggressive? Is it melancholy? Uh, is it exciting? So depending on what you chose as a topic, whether it was topic one or two, is going to dictate how you basically present your attitude and your tone throughout your two to four pages. So any questions with those three questions as it relates to blog three? Um, so that's what we're going to be doing, like for just those questions for blog three, right? Yes. Okay. And you just need to answer them with one sentence. Okay. Um, blog four, when we look at that right now, is, again, due about the same time. You can write them all up at the same time and just put blogs three through four and send it that way if that's easier. Uh, okay. You can do an individual. Let's say you want to do blog three today and blog four tomorrow. You can do it that way as well, as long as I can get them both in by 
a deadline of this Saturday, 1159, you're good. Okay. Um, the three questions in block four sort of relates back to the last three. How does your content in SA1 impact your purpose, audience, and tone? So what I'm looking for here basically is, is the content you provide in your essay appropriate and interesting for your audience, for your purpose, and for your tone? Mean, does it match? Um, is it appropriate for a narrative slash descriptive paper? Is it appropriate and interesting for telling a story and giving description? So again, you should be able to answer that one uh, in one sentence. And you could probably piggyback a little bit on your answers from the last three questions in block three to sort of help you determine how your content, if it really is appropriate or not. And generally by this point, I hope, you know, by the end of this week, uh, if, if not sooner, everybody is drafting SA1, because we're gonna talk a little bit about that because technically it's due next week, I believe. Uh, we will look at the due dates real quick. Um, so if you want to start sending drafts to me or smart thinking, I would go ahead because there's other classes that have started their SA1 and started sending me drafts and I'm giving them feedback as quickly as I'm reading through them. So if you have something that I can read, I uh, definitely email me your drafts as an attachment. And we'll talk a little bit more about MLA style here in a minute. If you're still wondering, how does he want me to style this paper? I will show you how to go about doing that. Um, but again, I would probably send smart thinking something first, wait until you get a response for them. It usually takes about 24 hours or less, depending on how busy they are. Then I would correct what they want you to correct and then send me your revised version. And then I will give you feedback. That way you have my eyes and their eyes both looking at your paper pretty much within a uh, day or two. So you can go ahead and really get a paper that's you're you know you're proud of that you want to send in and get a good grade. Uh, number two, what is the thesis statement for your essay? And you've probably heard of this before, uh, high school or middle school or another English class at the college level. Uh, your thesis statement needs to be the last sentence in your introduction paragraph. It basically tells your audience the main idea of your entire paper. So if you're writing a two to four page essay one, that thesis statement needs to be one complete sentence, must end with a period because we're not asking a question, and it must basically tell me what your main idea of those two to four pages are gonna be. Uh, and I think we talked a little bit about this maybe last time. The thesis statement is more or less the fuel of your paper. It's like if you run out of gas on the highway in your car, you're basically stranded. Well. If you don't have a strong thesis, and we'll talk a little bit about strong and weak thesis statements here in a minute. If you don't have a strong thesis or don't have a thesis at all, then your paper is gonna run out of gas really fast. And you're basically writing for the sake of not giving me a point. And I'm basically reading, trying to find your main idea and searching and looking and I can't find it. So your grade is definitely gonna suffer and suffer fast. So you. Pretty much with everything that you write in this class, you always need a strong thesis. So when we get to essay two, you're gonna need a thesis statement. Essay three, four, and five, thesis statement. So just keep that in mind. Thesis statement is not gonna go away. <clears throat> um, the last question is, what organization method do you plan to use throughout SA1? And if you looked in your textbook, they talk about three basic organization methods as it relates to body paragraphs and that type of stuff. One is chronological order. Basically, you start at the beginning, go to the middle, and then you go to some sort of conclusion or end, or first, second, or third, or A, B, or C. Your other method of organization is order of importance. Right. This is not so much important. This is sort of a, uh, important. This is really important. And then you have the spatial order right? where you sort of describe stuff throughout the room. You would probably usually use the spatial order more if you're describing a particular setting or environment. So keep in mind, this this is a narrative slash description paper. So you still want to go back and use your five senses where you can. Now, you're not going to be able to use all of them, obviously. Uh, the obvious one is going to be sight. So you should be able to describe stuff. Uh, the other obvious one might be 
you know, hearing. Um, touch and taste may be a little difficult depending on what you're doing. Um, and smell, you might be able to do smell relatively easy depending on your topic. So when I'm thinking about your th uh, five senses, I'm thinking you can use at least three out of the five uh, to create that movable picture in my mind. Because again, you're not only trying to tell a good story, you're also wanting to tell with your adjectives, with your descriptive words, with your senses, you want to describe a good story too. So that's blog four pretty much in a nutshell. Three questions. Three answers, three complete sentences is all I need. So if you look total, you're basically answering six questions and giving me six complete sentences. That is what is due definitely Saturday by 11.59. Any questions with blogs three or four now? I think that one, I think I got that one now. Okay. Makes a little bit more sense. Yes, I was so like I didn't when I was reading it. It said a group, and that that's what threw me off. I'm sorry. I've probably yeah, it's probably because of the textbook, and usually we would have if you were in a class. Gotcha. We would probably do a lot more of these with groups, uh, but since we're online and everybody has different schedules, it's really right. hard to pick partners and get in groups. Yeah, I'd rather do it by myself, anyways. That's why I was like wondering, like, um, okay. Uh, let's take a look at what thesis statements are, right? A, thes a thesis statement must have the following qualities. It must be arguable, meaning for it must state a point of view or judgment about your topic. It must be supportable, for it must contain a point of view that can be supported with evidence, such as reasons, facts, stats, examples. It must be sp uh, specific enough, for it must be precise enough to allow for a coherent argument and remain focused on your topic. So you don't want to get, that was the whole purpose of doing blog two, the outline, because the outline is supposed to sort of give you the blueprint of how you're going to go ahead and start structuring your paragraphs. What are you going to have in those particular paragraphs? So if you look down here, I give you a couple of examples, and of course there's about you know eight more in your book, um, of strong thesis statements. The thesis statements that yours should sort of resemble when you're doing essay one and essay two and essay three. So if you look at this first one, it says exposing children from an early age to the dangers of drug abuse is a sure method of preventing future drug addicts. Well, if you look, it is arguable because folks can kind of read that paper and say, well, I agree with your argument, but what about those that sort of slip through the cracks, right? They've been um, exposed to dangers of drug abuse, but when they turn 16, they still sort of, you know, picked up, you know, smoking um, marijuana or cocaine or, you know, abusing alcohol. So we can argue that point. This particular paper would be supported, right? You're going to assume that the the writer of this thesis statement is going to have reasons, facts, examples, maybe secondary sources from like research stuff. And it's also pretty much specific. It's precise, meaning it's one sentence long and it's not giving me four or five different particular topics that you want to sort of argue for or against. It's sort of focusing basically on the dangers of drug abuse and exposing children at a young age to that danger that hopefully as time goes on, it will prevent future drug addicts. So if this was gonna be say a two to four page paper like your essay one needs to be, I would expect you know pages two and three to really talk about this main point. And with your paragraphs sort of leaning back or you know coming back to this main idea of your paper. The next one deals mainly with uh, literary analysis, stuff that if you were going to take like 1102 course, or if you've taken a high school English course where you're talking about novels and short stories and that type deal, we have a, you know, one of those literary thesis. But again, as you can tell, it, it there's an argument to it. There's going to be support. We, we just assume because we don't have the entire paper here 
and it is specific enough. And even though this sentence looks like it is two sentences, it's really one long lengthy sentence, which is fine um, because it fits the criteria of what a strong thesis statement needs to be. Weak thesis statements are the ones that you need to try to avoid, or if you don't have one at all. Um, again, your book lists a couple other weak th thesis statements, but here are a couple of ones that I've seen in the past of previous papers I've had to grade. So my paper will explain why imagination is more important than knowledge. Well, again, you don't want to give any kind of a description of what you will discuss in your paper or declaration of your subject. You're writing the paper. I should know by your thesis what you're going to explain anyway. This is just redundant, and it's telling me you don't really have a thesis statement, and you don't really know where you're going to go in the next two to four pages. So when I read that, then I'm already knowing by the time I get to your second paragraph, ugh, this is not going to be a good paper. Just even, even if your grammar and everything else is on point, your method of organization, your development, your structure, your, you know, your content is just not going to be there. And this paper would probably break down about page two as well. So you're going to sit there and write a three or four page paper and not be happy with the grade you get because you're basically typing to nowhere. You're not taking me to a point or a journey. Um, so it's going to be sort of like a waste of time for both of us, waste of time for me to read and grade and waste of time for you to type because you don't have a strong thesis. The next one sort of gives a unreasonable or outrageous claim or insults, you know, the opposing side. So you want to be careful about giving thesis statements that do that, right? Uh, because again, at some point, you're going to run out of ideas to how to make that claim work. And it usually comes about the second or the third page. So be careful that you're not insulting, you know, the opposite side and you're not giving a whole lot of different, I guess you could call it um, like conspiracy theory type stuff without really able to uh, back it up with support. So be careful of those thesis statements. Generally, I see those later in the semester more so than I do with the narrative and descriptive paper. Uh, the next statement pretty much gives a obvious fact. It's something that's hard to disagree with. And it really pretty much gives your audience a dead end approach. And that's saying like it has here, advertising companies use sets to sell their products. Well, anybody that has a brain and that has watched ads for the last 15 or 20 years would know that. There's nothing that you can disagree there. There's nothing that you can, you know, prove or disprove because it's already there, right? Um, the person using that lipstick is trying to sell you on that lipstick so you can have lips just like that actress. Um, it's just like if it bleeds in the news, right? Bad news usually gets more ratings. It's just sort of, it's obvious. We know that. Um, think about some of the news that you might have, might have heard or read or watched lately. There's nothing good in the news anymore. And if they do uh, produce any good news, it's usually the last two minutes before it ends. So the first, you know, hour or 30 minutes is always about somebody getting shot, killed, maimed, uh, protest, riot. Um, they're hating Donald Trump. They're hating the Democrats. There's nothing good in the news. Uh, because nobody likes to hear good news anymore, I guess. They, they like to hear the violence. They like to see uh, people get hurt. Um, and it's really sort of a sick way to, to think about it, but that's how it always been for a while. I mean, if you go back to YouTube and look at the news 20 years ago, it's still sort of the same. Um, I think it's just getting a little bit worse now and aggressive more, but it's still back then, just like uh, sex selling advertising, right? Hair products, dresses, shoes. It was back there in the 1950s. Um, so just be careful of giving obvious thesis statements. The last one that you want to sort of avoid is the thesis statement that is either too broad like this one is or too narrow. Uh, the life of Abraham Lincoln was long and challenging. Well, if anybody's had American history, or U.S. history, then we know Lincoln's life had a long and challenging aspect to it. Again, if I can read your thesis statement and have to sort of ask the question, so what? 
and you can't really give me a strong answer to the so what. And chances are either you have a really weak thesis statement or you don't have one at all. So you want to be careful about those particular pitfalls because, like I said, this stuff is not just going to go away with essay one. You're going to have to remember it for the next essay, for the essay in October, for the stuff in November. So it builds. Any questions about the strong versus the weak thesis statement? I don't think I have any questions. Okay. If we look to, I talk a little bit about topic sentences and there's information in last week and this week's reading about topic sentences. And basically what a topic sentence is, it's sort of like a mini thesis statement for your particular body paragraph. Each one of your body paragraphs in your essay always needs to have as its first sentence, the topic sentence. Because what's going to happen with that topic sentence, if it's written well, the topic sentence is going to express the main idea of that particular paragraph. So that's why it needs to be one sentence in length. And it really only needs to contain one idea. Because really, if you look at it, go by the rule of one idea per paragraph. Because if you try to jam in four or five ideas in one paragraph, one, you you may get lost as the writer. Two, the reader is going to get lost. And three, your paragraph is just going to be really, really long and awkward that we're not really going to get your main point or message that you're trying to get across. So you want to use paragraph breaks, right? You want to break a paragraph when you start to talk about a new topic or, or start a new paragraph. So that's where the whole deal of getting out of writing the five paragraph hamburger essay like you've probably written before in the past, where you have the introduction, three body paragraphs, and the conclusion. At this level in college, you probably and you will need to write more than three body paragraphs. Um, now, with essay one, the five paragraph uh, theme works fairly well. You might be able to get away with it, you know, doing it with essay one, but when we get to essay two, and that paper needs to be, let's say, um, four to five pages, then you might need to write, you know, the introduction and conclusion are obviously one and two paragraphs. You may have to do five or six body paragraphs just to get to page four and five. So with each new essay that we do, we're upping the page length and we're upping the word count. So you're going to have to write longer and more paragraphs, especially when we get close to November and you've got to do a six to eight page research paper. You're going to have to probably have anywhere from 15 to 20 paragraphs to make that limit. Otherwise, you're going to be short six pages. And it's not going to help your grade when it comes to that. Um, and that's why we take a little bit with each essay. We up the paper length a little bit. So it gets, gets you practice writing longer paragraphs, writing longer and concise sentences, uh, using more words effectively instead of fluff, right? There's a difference between fluff in a paper and using the right type of diction and words that you need, um, which that's why we take August, September, October, November, to sort of get y'all prepared to do that research paper. And we hope by the time you leave in December, you have the tools that you could do any type of research paper for any other class after you leave this one. Because chances are, you're going to have to write another research paper, maybe more than once, before you graduate. So just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing, sort of some due dates to sort of look at. Again, last week I gave you in the week one folder uh, some pages to look at that deal with sample essays. So if you're still sort of, what does he want me to, how, how does he want me to style my paper? If you look at the narrative and descriptive student essays on pages 92 through 94, 96 through 98, if you read those, you, you will have a general sense how your paper should look. Again, that's those are A quality papers. So you can't go wrong, you know, following something. Um, two students that made an A on that particular paper when they had a riot. And of course, you can always send me rough drafts between now and Wednesday next week, which is what I said here. If you want to uh, send me your smart thinking drafts, I really need to see them by midnight 
on the 9th, which if you look, that's next Wednesday. So you basically have seven days to send me a draft. Again, it's strongly, um, it's optional, but strongly recommended. Because again, the more people that look at your uh, or look at your paper, usually the better your grade will be on that paper. And not only that, throughout the course, because you're going to probably, you know, continue to send people drafts to get the best possible grade. Um, again, it's not really going to be a graded thing. I'm not going to look at it and give you a grade for them. Basically, looking at it and giving you feedback to say, hey, here are your problems. You fix these, you should be on your way to your A. If you don't fix these, then I can't guarantee that you're going to get the A. So again, that's up to you. How many drafts you want to send me in smart thinking between now and next Wednesday. Um, the grammar quiz, the first one, and we're going to look at some of the grammar worksheets or the questions on the or the sentences on the grammar worksheets here momentarily. The actual grammar quiz is going to be due. Um, the 11th, which is a Friday, uh, September 11th by 11.59. You're going to see that drop box and you're going to see the actual grammar quiz when week three opens up this weekend. Now, you don't have to wait until the 11th to turn it in, right? If you want to start next Monday on it and finish it because it's only 10 questions and you want to turn it in on Monday, I will go ahead and start grading it on Tuesday. So you don't have to wait a full week. Or longer to turn it in. I just need it in by 11:59 of 9/11. Otherwise, at midnight, it's going to disappear, and it's going to give you a grade of zero. And I can't reopen it, and I can't give you, you know, make up that type deal. Because basically, now you have nearly what eight, nine, ten days to do it, um, or so. Just keep that in mind. Uh, the essay one rough draft or the final draft rather, the one I'm really going to be grading is due next Sunday, the 13th. There will be a Dropbox where you basically upload your Microsoft Word attachment. That will open up when the week three folders open up. Uh, that's where you want to send your final drafts, the one that you want me to grade. Uh, don't, send, um, don't send your rough drafts there because if you do, it's going to force me to grade your rough draft as your final, and most folks don't want me to do that. What I would suggest if you want to send me rough drafts is go through your student email, email me your Microsoft attachments. That way we can continue to send back attachments back and forth without having to go through the Dropbox and deleting this or deleting that or screwing that up. So that's sort of your due dates for week three coming up. And besides the weekly reading for week three, these are the only major things that are going to be due by the end of next week. Any questions with week three or sort of the tail end of week two here? Yes, no, I guess everybody's good. Yes, I'm good. Okay. So let's look back at the grammar. Uh, Again, the grammar basically was practice. This I only narrowed it down to the 15 that you needed to do for this week. Next week, you need to finish 16 through 30. Um, it's practice, meaning I will mark it for being wrong, but if you do all of them, I will give you that 100 for giving it the good old college try. But I will show you originally what you would make had it been a quiz that I had to grade. So if you get a grade that's lower, just know it's up there for a couple, you know, for a couple hours just to say, hey, you really need to focus on this particular error because when you got to do the actual quiz next week, if you do it, that particular error again, it's going to hurt your grade. And the same thing, this is how the grammar and essay one is going to come into play because if you can't correct a, a run on sentence or a comma splice on a grammar quiz, then unless you send me drafts, you're not going to really know how to correct that on your own essay one. So you're going to screw up on essay one because you don't know how to fix the grammar. So that's sort of the reason why we do grammar quizzes so they can help you with actually writing because good writing needs to have good grammar. So if you look at number one, in this case, the only thing that you needed to do this particular, uh, 
sentence has a comma splice. And what a comma splice is, is basically you're using a comma between two complete thoughts um, where you don't need to have a comma. So in this case, we're using a transitional word there with hints. And if you use a transitional word in the middle of your sentence, you do need a comma at the end, but at the beginning, you always punctuate it with a semicolon. So keep that in mind if you're using transitional words in essay one, you always have a semicolon, your transition word, and then your comma. So on the quiz, that's all you would have to do. You don't have to rewrite the sentence. You just have to tell me that, hey, you need to get rid of the comma and you need to put the uh, semicolon there. Okay, I did it on my on my own. Like I actually like rewrote the sentences and everything. Yeah, I think you most folks want to overthink the grammar stuff and they don't really need to because usually with these, you only need to do a couple changes and that's it. Gotcha. Oh my gosh. So if you look at number two, number two is similar. It's a comma splice. So what you have to do, I allow the comma to actually help me because you probably heard of the word coordinating conjunctions or the acronym fanboys. For, or, and, nor, yet, so, but, that type deal. So there I put comma four because I do have two complete thoughts, but I need to join them. And the way to join, join them is by just putting the four after the comma. Then I'm done. I don't have to do anything else to it. That's all you had to do. So if you had something like that on your quiz, which you probably will, just know that, hey, I can use comma and the fanboy. Which fanboy works? You'd have to read to see which one really makes sense logically. But the only thing you had to do was put four there, and that would be done. Don't have to rewrite the sentence. Don't have to change much. Number three and four are both what they call fragments. Um, because prior to the red stuff here, it was just running a temperature between 101 and 106. The problem is we don't have a main verb, so we need is there. Running is not a uh, verb in this case. And we needed a subject. Somebody had to be running that temperature. So that's why I just made up a name and put Peter. Now you could put I, or you could put Joe, or you could put Christy. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have a subject and a complete verb now, that completes the run-on sentence or the fragmented sentence in this case. Number four is more of a fragment too. The only thing that you needed to do was get rid of and because generally you don't want to start sentences with coordinating conjunctions or fanboys. So if you find yourself starting sentences with and, but, yet, so get out of that habit because 95% of the time you're going to create a fragment on yourself. So again, the only thing I needed to do is I needed a subject. Well, I put I there. Because I corresponds with my again, I won't have to change that out. Now, if you did this, if you did something like Jessica, then you need to change the pronoun to her. Right? You could go that way and you can still get credit. I would go with what, you know, what's easiest. Work smarter, don't work harder. Don't over, you know, don't overthink this grammar quiz stuff. You have nearly two or three weeks when it comes to essays to be a little bit more experimental with how you style your sentences. But with the grammar quiz, they're only going to be 10 questions. They're going to be 10 points apiece. You want to do what's going to give you that A. So don't overthink. Yeah, because I definitely did on that one. Um, number five is more or less a run on because without the period, because we have one sentence here. And then we have a second sentence there. So you just need to provide a period and capitalize the T. That's all you needed to do. You wanted to give me two sentences instead of one sentence that just keeps running on and on and on and on with no punctuation. And again, that's all you needed to do. There was uh, really, it was that easy and that quick. And it's going to be that easy and that quick on the grammar quiz if you don't overthink it. So on the grammar quiz, you're probably going to have about 30 minutes or so. Because there's only 10 questions, it should take you maybe 15 minutes max if you really know what you're doing. If you look at number six, we need again add sort of a coordinating conjunction and we need another, we need to rename or have another noun in the second part of the sentence. So a friend is always willing to help, comma, so a friend's friendship is invaluable. 
That's all you need to do is put this little bit right there and you're done. No need to re rewrite the sentence. No need to take more stuff out. No need to add really more stuff in. This was the only thing I had to add in and that was it. Number seven and eight deal with misplaced modifiers. So again, if you looked at your e-text from pages 195 to about 211 or 216, you're gonna review all this stuff. Uh, if you look at the, the grammar stuff from last week or this week in your folders, you're gonna have more websites that's gonna sort of detail a little bit more about coordinating conjunctions, about fragments, about run-ons, about dangling modifiers. So that just is gonna enhance your ability to do these worksheets and plus study for that quiz. So if you look at number seven, we needed to uh, move the modifying phrase on the telephone closer to the young man because otherwise, um, I think it was was walking the dog or something here. I think I left that off. Otherwise, what it was saying originally was that the man was walking the dog who was on the telephone. So unless you're Brian Griffin from Family Guy, most real life dogs don't have cell phones and they can't talk on them. So that's why that sentence was really awkwardly written. And a lot of these dangling and misplaced modifiers make you laugh when you actually start reading them out loud. So on the telephone goes with the human because humans talk on phones, not animals. If we look at number eight, the same thing here, was that sour was closer to waiter. Well, the waiter can not really turn sour. I guess his attitude can. But really what it was referring to was the wine, right? We return the sour wine to the, to the waiter. And that's all you had to do was just move sour from the back of the sentence closer to what it modifies, and it modifies wine. The wine is what's sour, not the waiter. Nine to 10 are dangling modifiers. You really need to add a subject and a complete verb. In this case, for number eight and for number 10, they both need to sort of have a past tense component to it. So while I was living in Spain, comma, I thought learning Spanish was easy. Because otherwise, without that, you're saying living in Spain, learning Spanish was easy. Well, Spanish can't live in Spain and learn, learn itself, right? Human beings usually live in a country and they usually learn the language. So that's why you need to have a pronoun or a subject there uh, to complete that thought. The same thing with number 10, because originally it said planning for the football tournament, time was short. Again, short time doesn't plan for a football tournament. People do. So that's why I put I was, you needed a complete subject and verb, and you needed to keep it in past tense. I added the comma and the... Uh, you know, the fanboy here, and I realized my, because my is referring back to I. So you needed to add a little bit more to those to make it make sense. Any questions with the first 10? Because usually when I think of essay writing, the fragments, the comma splices, the run-ons, the dangling modifiers, and the misplaced modifiers are usually the big five errors that I see in that first spot, or in that first uh, paper. And it's usually what, help, you know, hinders the grade from making, you know, 85 to a 95 or 75 to an 82 or 65 to a 74. Uh, that's why it's always important. You know, I can't stress, let somebody look at your work, whether it's me, smart thinking, somebody else, all three of us. Let somebody read your paper between now and when it's due next weekend. All right, so for number 11 and number 12 and number 13, I'm basically supplying the correct either transitional word or the coordinating conjunction in, in the place of the original. So here I would need to have comma and because it makes the most logical sense. With number 13, comma so, again, it makes the most comma, you know, logical sense. Number 12, I put moreover as my transition word. Because again, it makes the most uh, common sense there to fit both of the, you know, this one sentence with the next. Number 14 was already correct as it is. So keep this in mind. On a 10 question quiz, you may have one or two that are already correct. You're going to have to tell me that. So don't let, you know, a correct sentence fool you up 
on a quiz because sometimes I throw that in there just to see how well you're paying attention. Um, the other thing is sometimes I use similar sentences that we looked over in our handouts or on the web or in our book as test questions. So if you're keeping up with the stuff in the weekly folders, if you're keeping up with the reading, if you're keeping up with these practice sheets, you may see the same question. It may be changed up a little bit. Instead of putting John, I may put Jessica. Um, but again, it's showing me how much did you pay attention in the last two weeks when we've been talking about this. So don't be surprised if, you know, number seven appears again. But in this case, it says the young woman and still walking the dog, it's walking the cat. Could happen. Um, the last one in this particular case deals with parallelism because before it had something just, I think it was to play his guitar. But if you notice, we have an ING with reading first. Mr. Jones enjoys reading. And this is why we need to change uh, the infinitive form more into a past participle form um, or present participle form with ING with playing. Because it makes sense with saying reading and playing, not reading and play. Um, and that's all you would have to do with number 15. Now, for the next, you know, 16 through 30 that you needed, you know, to sort of look at, you can turn in if you want to see if you're going in the right direction. Again, I will give you sort of that, you know, you're giving it good old college try 100 because I see something. You have the next 15 done. I will mark it up, though, and give you sort of a general indication, hey, you might want to study number 12 a little bit more or number, you know, number 22 a little bit more or number 30 a little bit more just because you don't want to make that similar mistake one next Friday on the on quiz one or next Sunday in essay one. Does that make sense or does that clarify these first 15? Yes. OK. All right. Um, let me see here. Yeah, this is week two. So I did put a, um, again, with Monday being our video lecture, I put that up. Generally, what's going to have to happen, though, is uh, because Blackboard only allows you to uh, upload a lot, you know, certain amount of videos every Wednesday or Wednesday at midnight, the video that I put up on Monday is going to go away just so I can have room to put this video up. This video will probably stay up to Saturday or Sunday. Then it would go away, and then the next week's folder will open up, and you will have that new uh, pre-recorded video for the the following Monday. So just keep that in mind. The videos are only going to be up for you know the first one probably up until Wednesday, uh, the second one probably up to Saturday or Sunday. Uh, what I would suggest, right, because these weekly folders will disappear at the end of the week and open up to the next weekly folder. If you need to print out or save, I would do so probably by Friday or Saturday. One thing that you can do if you don't want to waste a lot of paper is go to that particular site because a lot of these are going to be hyperlinked. Copy this particular um, address into a Microsoft Word file, you know, just copy and paste so you can come back and just click on it. You don't necessarily have to copy and paste all this onto that, but you have the address. You can come back and find it. Because otherwise, Saturday midnight or Sunday midnight, all this is just going to go black. It's going to disappear. Okay. So that's probably what I would do. Um, because if you look, probably on yours right now, mine show these, right? My week three, week four, and week five are great. On yours, it probably just shows week two. It's yeah. because there's a seven-day um, timeline for these folders. So that's why week one disappears. That's why if you need to get stuff from week one, you have seven days to get it. Otherwise, it's going to go adios. And the same thing with week two. So today's Wednesday. You have the rest of the day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It'll probably be open until about midnight, and bam, that's going to go away too. And then week three will open up. So just keep that in mind as we go through um the next few weeks any questions any concerns um 
Yeah. That's pretty much all I had to cover. It looks like you're the only one that was able to make it. Um, already. I was going to ask you about the blog, but you already took care of that. Um. Okay. So I haven't logged in on because you remember um I couldn't log in on Smart Thinking, which I guess I can try again. Maybe it'll let me to this time. And do I just like write my essays in that and then? You should be able to save your essay as a, you know, the Microsoft Word attachment. Yeah. You should be able to upload it. Okay. Let's look at that real quick. Hold on just one second. I'm going to see if I can maybe see what's going on on your end. Um, why I won't let you necessarily okay. get up there. It should. Let's see what you might be. Sometimes it takes a while because I know we had some folks um, joining classes late. So sometimes that might throw it off for a minute. But usually by the second week, they should have already had you in there. Okay. Yeah, I haven't. I actually haven't. So it's, it's, yeah, it looks like this, right? So you need to use your yeah. custom funds email address. So let me try. Let me see if I can do it on my end with your stuff. So you're probably going to have to give me your birthday here in a minute. Um, Okay, so what's yeah. your birthday? Um, 11, 19, 90, 1999. See if it works. Yeah. Or try, like, because I think it was, like, 11, 19, and then you got to do the 1999. Okay, let's see. So, 11, 19. 1999. Try that. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Let me see if I can talk to somebody that's over this. Okay. Um, I will see what's going on with that. Uh, it could be that it's um, because people are still sort of enrolling in classes a week or so later. It could be they're, they're trying to get everybody sort of in place before they – usually what they do, though, and this is what you could check. Uh, in the past, they usually send emails, and I say either Smart Thinking or – the college will send you an email to your Coastal Pines account giving you your username and your password, your password. for this. Okay. So if you, you might need to go back and look at your junk mail or your trash mail because sometimes it gets you know thrown up in there. Um, okay. Because I think one of my students down in Camden said he checked his email the other day and it was there. So it might just be slow moving or it could be you know hidden somewhere within inside your email. All right, I'll look check, on my yeah, email. Double, double check that, and if it's not working, let me know as soon as you can so I can see what I can do on my end because I don't really have any control of that. Uh, we have somebody in Waycross that usually works on that, so I'd have to email or, or talk to her about it and see what's going on. Okay. Yes. But sir. in the end, I mean, if smart thinking doesn't work for SA1, you can always send me drafts, and hopefully by the time we get to SA2, which will be later in September, everything will be working for smart thinking. Alrighty. But you know, some some folks might be able to log in. Uh, right. If this is your is this your first semester? Yeah, this is like my I've never this is like no. my first time ever taking college. So. Well, that could be the other issue. It could be since you know if somebody's already in the system, you know they've already had a class that, let's say last spring or over the summer. Their yeah. stuff is probably already in there. It's not going to change because your birthday doesn't change. Your email address doesn't change. Doesn't change, right. So they might be able to log in where being that you're sort of the newbie, it's taking a little bit longer because they have to get all the new folks' information up in their database. Okay. So That's that could be the problem too. But, let, you know, try again. See if they send you something out. Okay. And then if not, let me know, and then I can see what I can do or at least give you an answer to – and it could just be, hey, you're new. You got to wait a couple more days. Yes, sir. That sounds good. Uh, any other questions then? I think that's it. Okay. Um, if I always, have any more, I'll definitely email you. Yeah, you can always email me or you know call or whatever the case may be. Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm usually in Brunswick, so I have a good bit of uh, stretch of time after my first class. Okay. Yes, sir. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm in Camden. I have three classes there, and sometimes it's it's easier just to email me 
instead of trying to, you know, call me on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, But I do have a little bit of time in between, I guess, from 11 to about 4, I'm kind of free. And then I'm, again, free from about 5.30 to about 6.30. Okay. Um, But basically from like 8 to 11, I have two classes. And then I have a class from 4 to 5.20. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I look forward to looking at some of your drafts and grading your blogs. And I hope the the grammar stuff didn't scare you too much when you looked at the grade. That's why I was going to give everybody. Yes, when I looked at it, I was like. Can I redo that? Yeah. But I guess like I I didn't even think about it. Like I, I should have looked I should have actually looked at the notes before I went ahead and jumped on it, but next time I'll know. Yeah, and it's just practice. It's just to say, yeah. hey, if you want to do better because the quiz is coming, you don't want to make, you know, you don't want to make the 44 or whatever it was. So right. Yes, um, sir. It's just there in a lot of ways to to show me how much you know and to show yourself how much studying you really need to do. Need to do. I was also, is the textbook like on the blackboard? It will will say like the, is that what, is that it? What we have to like. um, This one here? Yes. Is that what we like? Okay. That's what I was making sure of too. Yep. That's the only textbook we need. Okay. So you just go through there and if you look on like your checklist or if you look on the syllabus, I give you the page numbers or what to find stuff. The oh, stuff that's not in your textbook is the reason why I have the lesson folders. Okay. That's where I can upload the other stuff or give you additional information about some of the stuff that's okay. in the textbook. Okay, sounds perfect. So in a lot of ways, it's sort of a double whammy, but certain aspects of the test textbook is kind of lacking. That's why I give you a little bit more information about narration. If you know you read the textbook and say, well, that's it. There's only two pages about narration. Well, if you come here, you got a web page to kind of look through, give you a little bit more. You got another video you can look at, that type deal. Okay. I think that makes more sense now. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you. You have a good uh, good weekend and uh, good uh, Labor Day, and uh, I'll see everybody. I guess live recording maybe uh, for uh, for Wednesday. Okay, at the same time. Yeah, uh, I think that works. Does it work for you? The three. To yeah, four? it works perfect for me actually. Okay. More than yeah. works best for me because I have work. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of folks can't attend. But I wanted to give everybody a chance to have a pre-recorded and a live one. Uh, okay. Being that uh, Monday is Labor Day, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get a pre-recorded video out. So it may just be that we have this, but you can okay. always email me. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Well, you have a good good Wednesday. You too. Thank you. Bye bye.